Um, so my little contribution before we start uh, the discussion is to give a little bit of an overview how we perceive uh, the future of work, what our stance is with regards to uh, independent work. And um, before diving into it, I think it's right to, to set a little bit the context and how the nature of work has actually changed uh, over the last decades. What we perceive on a global uh, level is that we really see there's a shift from jobs to work, meaning that there's a fragmentation of work that uh, is driven by, um, partly by, by macro trends like globalization, supply chains, uh, shifting of balance of economic power. And uh, a second thing that we see is that despite economic recovery in the EU, we still have a substantial part of the population that is either underemployed, so basically people who actively would like to work more, or those that actually don't have any chance to access or currently have no access to the labor market for different reasons. Um, with regards to the fragmentation of work, this is a very ugly slide, so, and um, that's for a reason. What you see, the fragmentation of work does not uh, stop with technology. So this is to give an overview that what Jeremiah has uh, said in his presentation, that there's a heterogeneity and uh, you cannot throw all platforms in one pot. And uh, what you see on the uh, left-hand side is actually a scheduling software that assigns with an algorithm shifts to, to workers. In the middle, you see Via, that's a ride-sharing company from the US that actually tells you Via Blue is at capacity, meaning there's no work at this very moment for you. And then uh, the last one uh, is actually a restaurant delivery service that also says uh, there are no available drive deli deliveries for this day. So what that means is that we do see these problems that uh, workers, even in the technology sector, uh, face um, a type of flexibil flexibility that is bad flexibility because what's happening here in these three examples is that the flexibility actually rests with the bosses and the employers and that's not what we want to stand for and that's exactly it. Uber is actually work at the touch of a button and it uh, provides genuine flexibility because uh, people can decide if, where uh, and for how long they want to use the Uber app um, as a driver or even as a courier. The career business has become a substantial part of our business. And this all happens with no exclusivity, meaning um, um, independent workers can make use of other apps. Um, no minimum commitment, no shifts, no favoritism, and no discrimination. So because of this flexibility, actually, there's no such thing as a typical Uber driver, because people that use our app, they actually um, use it to uh, organize work around their life schedule. And so we see that, for example, in Slovakia, 45% of Uber drivers spend actually less than 10 hours per week uh, using the Uber platform. Um, in the UK, that's 22%. So in total, uh, we have more than 2.5 million drivers and couriers that uh, use the Uber app either as a uh, driver or as a courier. And the single most important factor that we see that is important for them and, and the reason why they want to partner with Uber is actually the degree of flexibility that they enjoy with us. These are just uh, three examples that really show um, why they partner with Uber and why they actually prefer it to other options. London, 94% of drivers because I wanted to be my own boss and choose my own hours. Now. Flexibility is great, but at the same time, I think um, this has been made clear also uh, by Benedict uh, in his opening statement, is that what maybe in the public uh, opinion is not as uh, present is that we actually have two types of customers. On the one side, we have the rider who wants to have a ride and wants to have a great experience, so we need to focus on that. But on the other hand, we have a customer that is the driver who actually takes his business to us to say, hey, I'm using the Uber app because you are providing the best service and you um, provide the best features in the app and that's why it's, uh, it's uh, working the best for me and that's exactly what we want to keep. Um, we want to keep improving, we want to work on the experience and one of the first things we did is as part of the 180 days uh, change uh, initiative is that we're rolling out tips. Uh, currently it's live in the UK and France uh, in, in the US so that's something we introduced very recently. Another aspect is instant pay. Um, in the UK, that's flex, uh, flex pay. That basically allows uh, workers to cash out their earnings at any point, at any time. Um, that's very interesting for independent workers, I think, because uh, the average uh, amount of uh, days they have to wait for, for, them, uh, for their 
for the earning to come in actually to be transferred to the bank account is 30 days. Lastly, also from feedback that we got, this is driver's destination. That's another feature that actually allows drivers to uh, indicate during the day at what point in time they need to be somewhere. For example, I have a dentist appointment or I have to pick up someone. So he actually puts that in the app and then he will only get rides that are along this route and that's how he can actually better uh, organize his, his, uh, his uh, workday. Now, these are in-app features and they probably don't uh, address the fundamental questions that we want to talk about today. And we do see as Uber um, that there's a role actually for digital intermediaries to um, address some of the long-standing gaps that are persisting in the, in the social safety net for independent workers. Um, so what we did is we uh, started partnerships with third parties. For example, we partnered with Ipsy, that's the Association of Self-Employed and Freelancers in the UK, to provide uh, personal uh, sickness and accident uh, insurance cover. Um, we did the same thing with AXA Insurance in France. Um, and we're also working on partnerships with regards to saving accounts and uh, retirement plans with uh, Betterment in the US and uh, Money Farm in the UK. Same thing, what we try to do is we want to get better feedback. I mean, not the feedback should be better, but the way how we get it and how we can actually feed that into our process to improve the driver experience. Again, it's important to us because from a business point of view, if the driver is not happy with what we offer, he will take his business somewhere else. So, and with rising competition, that's clearly the case that we want to say, hey, you get the, you're getting the best package here, you have the best in-app experience, but at the same time, we're actually addressing issues that you are facing with regards to social safety, which actually go beyond the platform economy, and that's also something that has been raised before. What we want to do is actually to play a constructive part in the broader policy debate, because we have to remind ourselves that these issues that independent workers face today, they actually go beyond Uber, and certainly they go beyond the platform economy. In the EU 15, 98 million people are self-employed, and only 4% of them are using digital platforms. And that's why definitely there's a role for platforms, but we also need to uh, reconsider the uh, many frameworks, national frameworks. And I think the first, the first steps that we need to take is actually to look at flexible and portable saving accounts so that benefits that are accrued by someone who's uh, working for a company, that this doesn't stick, that, that, he can, that these are portable, that they actually move with him and they don't rest with the company where he has actually worked. Uh, secondly, lifelong learning and training. That's something very important. Um, I believe that especially with regards to, to learning experience, that's something going to school and then afterwards actually many workers have uh, less opportunities to, to uh, do recourses, uh, retraining and so forth towards a new profession. And we believe that with flexible work opportunities such as Uber, we can actually bridge those, uh, bridge those um, periods where someone is doing a retraining because basically what happens, a lot of people when they, for example, graduate from university, they apply for a job, they wait for the job application to come back, they don't take another job because uh, they might have a three month uh, notice period to, to cancel that one. With us, it's really you need to press the button, you get to work, you press the button, you, you stop. Um, so what this is all about is basically democratizing uh, the uh, access to independent work, but uh, at the same time, obviously, we need to work on the bigger framework of independent work that we are providing uh, tailor-made, uh, suitable uh, social safety options, um, and who's, we, who are the groups that actually would uh, pr um, benefit the most from this are the long-term unemployed, short-term unemployed, students, people with uh, personal responsibilities who actually find it difficult to find, uh, find uh, work opportunities that fit into their life schedule, and uh, people with disabilities. Um, on the point on long-term unemployed, 25%, uh, for example, that's a that's um, just an example from a Paris study. 25% of UberX drivers in uh, Paris uh, have been unemployed before and 40% uh, of them for more than a year. So uh, that's definitely an added value that we can provide and that we should actually look at how we can actually uh, foster this and how we can promote better uh, protection for, for those people. And with that, that is my contribution and I'm looking forward to a discussion. I'm really looking forward to hear about your experiences. Also from other uh, apps, so uh, looking forward. Thank you.